I'm an uh, architect, restorer, and anthropologist. I currently teach in uh, Birzeit University in the social and behavioral uh, department. Uh, I teach anthropology, social science, space, memory camps, and uh, I've been working in restoration for the last 26 years with Rewak Center in Ramallah. I, um, I am currently the advisor for Rewak as well. I do the editing of the monograph series on, uh, on architectural history in Palestine. I am Palestinian. I lived all my life in Palestine. I'm born in Palestine, working and living in Palestine. I studied also partly in Palestine before I joined other universities in the world. So I am Palestinian. I am proud Palestinian. I really like sometimes to say that I am Palestinian because I feel it exciting. It is exciting to be a Palestinian uh, because sometimes when I did my PhD in the United States, uh, my uh, American colleagues told me, why you don't stay? I said, if I stay, I will be one out of 200,000 anthropologists. But if, if I go back home, I am one of five. So it is exciting to be in Palestine and a Palestinian, especially in anthropology. I encountered it as an editor of Monograph Series and Rewalk when uh, we co-published the project Sawg al uh, or Designing Modernity in the Arab World. And Belintan and uh, Dima Yasser were the authors of that uh, a project. I know it before because this is a national project and everybody knows it knows about it. If if you are an architect or you are a politician or you are in humanitarianism or you are in the development discourse, you will know about Musa Alimi initiative uh, to to make something in Palestine uh, through architecture and through agriculture. So it, it is something that I am familiar with through Rewak, through my life in, in Palestine. And of course, I consume their products uh, as I, I used to consume the yogurt and the labani, the, the, uh, and the milk from that mashrua. Uh, we call it a mashrua. In any supermarket you get in Palestine, you will find this uh, brand called the mashrua. So I buy it because I know that part of the money will go to the, uh, to the guys who produce it. Strangely enough, I visited it in 1980s when I was a little kid. I visited with my father, with his friend, an orphan who was trained there. He was 12 years old and I was 13 or 14. So just imagine that I remember the water system, the pool, the cows, the housing area, the dining area. But really vaguely, that when Dima Yasser and uh, the Ben and Tan did the project, then I start to see what I saw like 30, uh, 40 years ago. So it was, uh, yeah, but everybody knows the entrance of that project because it has a, a gated community. It's a closed uh, area. It's a fenced area. And every Palestinian who traveled to Jordan will stop at that gate before they move to the Israeli side, to the Israeli side of the checkpoint. So I remember that every time we pass there, we read the sign, Mashu'an Sha'il Arabi, and then we go to, through the checks of the Israelis and go to Jordan. So it is part of our daily practice when you travel to Jordan. And this is the only way we travel. Uh, I think all of it is significant because there is no hierarchy. Uh, I think the small parts are equal parts of the project. Uh, but you know, the, 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 the building with the skylights, the workshop, it, it has something to my heart. I don't know, I like it more than the residence. Of course, the residence, we have similar residences like that. But I think that the, the complex is, multiple buildings and every building functions a specific thing and you cannot read it alone but all the buildings are modern all the buildings were built with concrete all the buildings trying to uh, to mitigate the heat try to make use of natural light and so on so it uh, it is kind of 
uh, romantic setting that is not reflecting Palestine as is today or even used before. So it is really a romantic setting in Jericho, especially the, the, the Green Valley, the, the oasis. They call the Jericho as the oasis. So I, I, I don't have any particular building, but that workshop with the skylights still makes sense for me. For me. I don't know why I still remember the pool. There was a pool there which is not spoken a lot in, in, the, in the text. And I don't know, the pool is uh, just to, uh, to use it for water and for swimming sometimes. But I don't know why nobody is paying attention to that pool. Uh, as a kid, I don't remember really vaguely the architecture because the architecture is not interesting from a Palestinian point of view. You can imagine what is interesting in Palestine is the stone and the ornamentation and the motifs. And this building is plain. Even that arcade is very plain, very, very simple. And we did not know that this is a school of architecture. Simplicity is an important issue. We we uh, are concerned more about the function, the, the architecture as a utility. We utilize architecture. For kind of, for some type of purposes, but not for beauty in itself. So this makes it beautiful for me as an architect historian. Now, going back, I can imagine what he thought about and what he was thinking of a new model of architecture that is uh, supposedly produced different kind of people. It's like the the I, I remember the separation between the residences where we met that kid. And the offices also, it's, there is a separation. All this is part of the modern plan, is how to manage to manage people in the space, how, how to manage people through the space, and so on. So I, I, I have these vaguely things, but I, I still remember the pool that is not be, nobody is paying attention to it. Jericho is known as an oasis because it has a water system that is not valued a lot nowadays. But without water, you cannot have anything in Jericho, and you cannot have life. And therefore, it is an important or integral part to the architecture. And of course, they were searching for water. The most important thing is water in this complex. If you don't have water, you don't have a settlement. You cannot have a project with cows and chicken and farming and so on, and even to have people drinking water still drink and washing. So it's, it was one of the key uh, elements in Jericho which is not, uh, I think, in our current practices in Jericho, we don't pay attention to this element. Uh, that, that's uh, in the core of what I'm doing for the last 30 years or 26, seven years. Uh, first of all, I wrote a lot about heritage in Palestine, and I think the discourse about heritage is a colonial discourse instead, European Eurocentric approach. And so we make faults because we are following that model still. Um, I claim that all colonial, both colonial discourse are driven by colonial legacy. This is what I, I think I spread with the, uh, for you as students to read about uh, heritage in Palestine. And um, two or three years ago, we, even did more mistakes. That mistakes, uh, one mistake is to make a new law. This new law put date again on the value, which means anything built before 1917, before Belfort or before the um, colonial, uh, British colonial era is considered heritage. Anything built after 1917 is not considered heritage. So from the beginning, we made a big mistake. So what? how you can differentiate 1917 from 1918 even, which is the same era. How you can differentiate 1917 from 1947, which is the same era. And this law made all the architecture built after 1917 or the international style or the new or the modern, the concrete, all not protected and therefore part of the destruction agenda. And we can see in Palestine that all these buildings, especially built after 1917, but mainly after Nakba, 1948, are not of a value and being destroyed every day. 
every day because these buildings are two, three floors, which means are not very economic. So to have only a, a land of 100, 1,000 uh, meters square with only one small building is not worth it. And because we have development and we have the increase in population and needs, we start destroying these particular buildings and build high rise buildings of 10 or 15 floors. So I think this part is being erased from our memory. This being erased as not part of Palestinian memory or heritage. And therefore I think we, we have to reconsider what is heritage and we have to reconsider these buildings because they are representative of dreams, representatives of materials, representative of architecture, kind of new architecture in Palestine, and we need to own it. So we, in one word, in the new law, we said, we don't own this. This is strange, and this is not worth it to be restored or to be protected. Now we are trying through Rewak to, uh, in the law, there is a provision says that any other buildings that uh, attain value other than the historic and the blah, 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 blah. So which means there is a provision in the law that you can uh, put in a list buildings that you consider valuable. And this we did with Ramallah municipality a long time ago. And now we are trying to spread the word. Let's try to protect if not all, but examples of this era. So Palestinians will not forget the 100 years that made Palestine actually. Before that time, it was Ottoman era. It was the Roman, it was the Crusades, it was the Mamluk. But this time really the last 100 years is the Palestinian, the Palestinian era. We, we know that Philistines exist forever, but it's not my point. It's not, it's my point that the architecture of the last 100 years was made by local Palestinians, everyday life manifested, our taste is, is, is there and so on. So we have to reclaim our history through claiming this kind of architecture. Uh, I, I would envision something against the current. Uh, the current is to change land into property, uh, real estate. And this is what has been done in the Jericho Gate project, for instance. It's a development like the new, uh, the new city of Cairo or the new planned city for uh, Amman and so on, or the, the development. You have boulevards and you have fountains and you have villas with the swimming pools and so on. I think this is the, the future of Jericho, actually. We are heading there. And we don't value Jericho as a productive area. For me, I think this complex and all the unbuilt areas of Jericho should be developed as an oasis that produce food, that produce things for Palestinians. Even the word Silicon Valley, I don't want to mention it because they want something like Silicon Valley in Jericho. Why we don't like Jericho, the cradle of civilization of the city? Why we don't like our heritage that much? I don't know really. It's, it's, it's against the logic. We claim that Jericho is the first settlement in the world. And this is so far acknowledged. And we want to convert it to a Silicon Valley. So who, who said that we want Palestine to be like Singapore or Silicon Valley? Who said that this is better or that better? I think, I don't want to say like, we want to preserve Mashrua as an agricultural area. But I think it should be ecological and should be environmental and should be feeding us. Why not? Why, why, why to buy my food from Israeli market? Why, why the kibbutz is successful while ours is going down? It's like, if you think that it's not successful, why the other is successful? So we can make even the, uh, the condition to succeed. It's like, we, we don't, I think Musa Alami, I think once said, that he was thinking of that model, the kibbutz, and making things from nothing almost, from a desert area. You can grow things and you can uh, take care of people and so on. So I think 
I, I think this complex should evolve into this kind of thing and can be, if you want to have it with a contemporary edge, you can call it organic farm. You can call it eco-friendly farm. You can call it fair trade farm. Do whatever you want, but don't lose this building or this complex in the real estate development in Palestine, because we we will add one state complex, real estate complex to Palestine or to the Middle East. Nothing extra, but a mashrua like Al Alami is something special. Is <laughs> the alone? Is the one in the Middle East or in Palestine?